I'm with Dr. Keith Linder today. He is the chair of the writing committee for the AASLD Primary Biliary Cholangitis Practice Guidance. Dr. Linder, thanks so much for being here with us today. Sure. So tell me a little bit about um, these new guidelines. I understand they have not been updated in a while, and it's been really, what, the first update in 10 years? Yeah. So the last update was 2009, and since that time, uh, the biggest change has been obeticolic acid, uh, OCA, approved by the FDA as uh, typically second-line therapy for PBC patients un with a suboptimal response to ursodeoxycholic acid in about 2016. So th this was new, and it's been an important advance in the field. First, we now have two FDA-approved therapies. Uh, previously, we hadn't had any for many, many years. So uh, we really thought this was timely to update the, uh, the readers about this. Well, tell us a little bit about the name change. I know that's been something yeah. that's been done for a while, but you know, for those of us who are not hepatologists, it, you know, it's a little surprising. Well, one, one of the things that happened really was that patients were uh, feeling discriminated against because of the term cirrhosis in primary biliary cirrhosis. Uh, it, it used to be more common to people that had cirrhosis on biopsy, but um, with earlier detection of the disease, only a minority of people had cirrhosis, and particularly in, in the UK, United Kingdom, people were being discriminated against when they had a diagnosis of primary biliary cirrhosis. They were having trouble getting life insurance, having trouble getting mortgages, and really it was focused on the term cirrhosis, which was really a misnomer anyway. And so, uh, led by the patients, the scientific community got together and. Uh, around that time, uh, there was really an international collaboration to change the name to primary biliary cholangitis. There was debate. We wanted to keep PBC. That's what we usually use. So a lot of consensus about that. Biliary cholangitis, they're a little bit redundant, but it made enough sense, and it kept the initials. So, And I think it's been really well accepted. I see it... Um, almost universally used at this point. So I think that's been a, it's been a nice change. And it, I think it was a good message for us to see how important the patient voice was in some of the decisions we make. Well, that's very interesting. I think it's always great to go right back to the patient, no matter what you know the, the, the issue may be. Let me ask you, what do you want the rank and file hepatologist to know about these guidelines as a take home message here from the meeting? Well, I think one of the most important uh, things it comes from work that we've done in conjunction with people at Henry Ford. And using a large database, we have found that only about 70% of patients who would have evidence of PBC on blood tests have a diagnosis made and are treated. So I think that we as a community need to do a better job of identifying uh, patients with a disease and then instituting treatment. We're fortunate that we've got two really good treatments that we can offer. Um, but if we don't think about it, the poor patients don't get a chance to get the, uh, the drug. So that would be the main thing. It's just we've tried to make it uh, straightforward in how to make the diagnosis. We no longer typically require a liver biopsy. Uh, so the diagnosis is straightforward. Um, and the treatments are oral um, and usually well tolerated. So that would be the main thing I'd like people to, to think about. Think about the disease. Think about initiating treatment. Well, thanks so much for being with us on the show today. It's always great to see you. I know that you've been a past president of the association and, and everyone's grateful for your service. Thank you. AASLD TV has all the coverage you want from this year's conference. Be sure to check out all of our content, which is updated every single day here on YouTube during the liver meeting in San Francisco.